Hello everyone and thank you for joining us for another COVID-19 toolkit. Um, I'm Bella Gore from Business Disability Forum um, and before we start uh, I should just let you know that this webinar is being recorded and it will appear on our website uh, on the COVID-19 toolkit on the BDF website uh, a little later on today. Um, it's also being live captioned by the lovely Orla at My Clear Text. So if you do want to turn on the captions, they don't appear automatically. Uh, navigate to your toolbar and on the right hand side, you should see closed captions and turn those on and you'll see the live captioning. Uh, we'll also be answering questions at the end. So please do ask via the Q&A box. Um, all the mics except those of the panelists um, are on mute. So um, you won't be able to ask questions by directly asking us, but you can via the Q&A tab and we'll leave some time for questions at the end. So as we all settle into uh, the new normal created by this coronavirus, today we're going to be exploring the impact of lockdown and the virus on our mental health. Uh, with me, I've got today Kerry Smith, a consultant and trainer with Business Disability Forum. Um, so welcome, Kerry. Hello, everyone. And um, Kerry, you're going to talk a little bit about your own personal experiences um, and your own coping strategies before and after uh, the lockdown, or sort of during, should I say. And um, mainly, we're going to discuss what managers and employers in particular um, can do to support colleagues, both the key workers and the people who can't do their jobs from home. And of course, the government has said that if you can't do your job from home, you are allowed to go in and travel into work and do and work there. And some people still are doing that. And there are, of course, the key workers, but also um, remote workers, those of us who are working from home, whether we used to do that before or not. So. Kerry, um, just a little bit about you first. You've done a fair amount of training on mental health and well-being, haven't you? Yeah, over the course of the years. Uh, I've been really lucky enough to work with many different organisations, um, particularly around the whole piece around how we have sensitive conversations, how we spot signs and how we can make sure that people, if they become um, slightly unwell or they feel like things are becoming more difficult in the workplace, how um, we as employers can, can maintain their ability to continue working, because we know that if people work, it's so much better for their, their overall health, including their mental health. So that's, that's the kind of area that I come from. Okay. So, um, we're going to sort of just get, get into to, to what we're going to talk about today and I want to start with the key workers um, that uh, um, many of us are at home but there's quite a lot of people who are still going into work um, and it's it is the NHS workers that we're all um, you know we're being asked to, to applaud for tonight but there's a lot of other people as well aren't there um, oh yeah yeah and I think isn't everyone and I mean everyone doing a fantastic job um, any of us that are still maintaining work, whether we're working from home, whether we are in shops, whether we're refuge collectors, delivery drivers, transport, um, care homes, the list is endless. Um, and I've been working particularly with some people in retail uh, because they are really on, on, on the front line. So I think everyone needs a big clap and a big thank you for or even those that are sort of working from home because we are still trying to maintain business and these are unprecedented times this is difficult for everyone um but it doesn't mean that we're not going to find it hard so yeah there's a lot of people out there that are doing their bit which is really mm. important but I'm concentrating on those people who do have to go out to go to work. So, you know, as you said, the shop workers, refuse collectors, post people, people working for utility companies, emergency services, care homes, and of course the NHS and, and, and many others. Um, have we come across any practical things that the employers for these key workers can do to support them? I, I know it's, it's really difficult at the moment and lots of people are working long hours. So if we take the people that are kind of still working frontline at the moment, in particular things like retail, care workers, we've heard a lot in the news about some care workers staying at the care homes away from their families to try and limit the spread of the virus. 
In terms of retail and, and, and frontline services, the kinds of things that I'm, I've come across through clients is working in rotation. So there are some organisations that are taking the whole of their employee group and they are saying so many are going to stay at home for a couple of weeks and then a couple of weeks the other half of the people are going to be working frontline and they switch it over. Um, so that's one thing that I've, I've come across. So it's a two-week on-off <laughs> rotation. Yeah, and one organisation that I work with is doing two months. So they have envisaged that this is going to take a lot longer to get things back to normal. And this is a frontline sort of retail outlet. And so what they've done is they've split their staff in half and they've said, right, everyone on full pay. Well, it's great they can do that. And I appreciate that not every organisation can do that. 50% of the staff are at home on full pay for two months. The other 50% have been asked to go in and work, but they've been given a, a pay increase. And then at the end of the two months, everyone will switch over. So, you know, we have to be realistic. We're trying to maintain as much of business as we possibly can by being safe. Yeah. Um, and there's been, for that organisation, that's something they can work with, which is great. Not every organisation can. Mm -hmm. Some organisations are dealing with severe, slow staff numbers, which means that there are some people that are working exceptionally long hours because people are self-isolating or because they're unwell yeah so talk about breaks because we're getting quite a lot of people sort of saying that um they don't have time for a break or they don't feel they ought to take a break because there is low staff numbers that's definitely what i'm hearing from individuals that work in frontline services and also um organizations that i work with more directly is is that those are, those are the people that are still working. And when I say frontline, I mean all the ones that we've mentioned before. So we're, we're including the NHS, the carers, the refuge collectors, the shop workers, the transport workers, everybody. Um, and I think what people are finding, individuals are finding, that they feel that if, particularly if there's people who are off, unwell, or looking after people, is that there's this pressure to work longer, to work harder because there's no one else to do it. So I think people, a lot of people that I'm speaking to are feeling as though it's great that they've still got their job, it's great that they're still doing the whole thing to help the greater good because we're all in this together, but actually when they get home in the evenings, they are exhausted. So there's this thing about what employers can do to try and um, assist people in that so that they stay well. So we breaks is really important. You know, are we making sure that people are getting the correct schedule breaks of course some of these organizations have restaurants but they've been shut they're shut yeah yeah that's really interesting point. i mean I, th I think first it's the explicit instruction you can take a break you should take a break breaks are important because they're important for mental health and well-being but when you do take a break canteens are shut but also coffee shops if you're on out on the go um as a you know delivery driver or something you you can't go and pick up a coffee um because there's nowhere to do that yeah yeah I mean, so advice yeah yeah so i think you know one organization i know that they've, they've put vending machines in they don't usually have vending machines they've put vending machines in um yeah, wipe those down think, well. yeah well obviously wipe them down yeah they're free so you know you just go so there's no money you go you press a button whatever um so at least people can get a cup of coffee or a cup of tea or whatever obviously vending machines these days you can get things like soup all sorts you know whatever yeah, you decide yeah, to do yeah, yeah. and i think also where you place them as well bella i think um you know do you have a facility where you can perhaps make sure that staff can get outside providing it's safe um, yeah that's that's a really interesting point actually because i mean we're, we're you know we're talking at the minute just about the people who are going into work we'll move on to remote workers and people working from home a bit later on but if you are going into have got stuff going into work an outdoor space if it can be cordoned off to be safe preferably with something green in it um yeah and socially just i think that that that's so important because i think one of the things that um prevent people from having breaks is one um they're under pressure they want to do their bit uh, and i get that so there's something needs to come we'll, we'll cover this later on but something needs to come from the top to say everyone needs a break we've got to make sure everyone's looking after mm. themselves but there's also where do you go and do you want to go and sit in a in a small staff room or a canteen when we're trying to respect social distancing so can people get outside i think is mm. is, is is something that needs to be considered providing it's safe to do so yeah yeah 
And, and there are situations, unfortunately, now as well, where tempers flare, people, everyone's under pressure, customers are under pressure as well. And um, sometimes people who are, are working out there are finding themselves witness to arguments or being on the receiving end of abuse. Have you got any um, advice for, for, for employees? I think this is, this is really tricky. What I'm seeing is you have people, some members of the public, let's talk about the public, because this usually comes from flare-ups from you know interactions between um, employees and 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 and, and their, the people that they're providing a service for so you you get some of some or some people that are kind of okay it's all right i've got a queue i've got to wait things are going to take much longer my delivery is not here my amazon prime oh my god amazon prime's like crashed you know my three days and you get some people that are kind of okay with that they're all right all right fair enough you know then you get others that actually and this could be a sign that they're finding things difficult where they do flare up. And a lot of that is because of the tension, the stresses, the worries, the concerns. And so we do as human beings take it out on others. So I think if you are working frontline and that happens, the first thing I'm gonna to say to you is make sure you stay safe. When we go back before COVID-19, um, the advice we would give Bella was so different. We would say, go over, approach, you know, use open body language. Um, we would talk about lowering your voice to try and calm the situation. And of course now, having to stay two meters away, you know, lowering your voice is not really an option. In fact, what we're doing is probably talking louder, which in itself as human beings is quite aggressive. So I think if you are in a frontline service and there is a situation which flares up, tempers fray, I think you need to make sure you stay protected. I think you need to make sure that you get you're, you're not on your own and you're not dealing with it on your own that can be difficult if there's a low members of staff working mm -hmm. I think you need to think about this stuff before it happens from the top so if you are in a shop if you are uh, working as an Amazon delivery driver, not just there's other delivery services, obviously, not just Amazon. Yeah, other uh, 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 online services are. Yeah, other yeah, online services. Yeah, I feel like I'm working for the BBC now. Um, but you know, you know what I mean. Takeaway collections, whatever. I think there needs to be a proactive conversation to say, what do we do in a situation where things get a little bit irated? Who do I call? Who do I speak to? It might be that you just have to walk away, which is not something we recommend in customer service. But in this situation, that might be something that needs to be done. Some of the mm. other things that I've seen is people are putting very clear statements on websites about the level of service that you can expect and what to do if you're not happy with it. I think that's, that's, that's important and it's, mm. it's reassuring for staff. Um, and... Um, so I think that's really, really important that you have that message from the top. And also the other thing I've seen is there's been an increase of security workers, so security staff in frontline services to try and keep that kind of buffer between staff and or colleagues, workers, co-workers, partners, whatever you want to call yourself, and also the people that you provide the service for. So there is definitely a shift where kind of... Um, uh, we are having to change the way in which we do stuff which kind of goes against all the original advice that we would give about um tampering down situation mm. and you've, um, you've talked a, a couple of times of messages from the top and thinking about this in advance and and i think there is something really important about communicating from leaders and leadership um at the moment um don't, don't you think about sort of and i don't think you can communicate often enough um whether it's to key workers or whether it's to people working remotely um in isolation away at home from the top yeah we have always said i've always said when it comes to mental health and well-being and we look at strategies to keep people well there's two key things that we need to do we need buying from the top we know that but we also need to be able to um start conversations at every level so we need to do more of that we're going to talk more about remote workers in a minute um, because that can be quite difficult if you're working remotely and you're still trying to maintain those conversations um, but i think we need strong leadership and we need leadership to be able to say to managers on the front line this is going to take a bit of time it's okay yes we are all in this together we keep hearing that the whole country we're all in it together but 
that doesn't take away the fact that for us, our own mental well-being and mental health, we will still have those niggles because we will still feel isolated. We will still feel the weight on our shoulders. So there's all these different pressures. So how do we alleviate that? We need the nearest and dearest that we work with to say, do you know what? As a manager, as a CEO, things are hard, things are tough, but what can we do together? And that's the important yeah i think it's that visible leadership at all levels and really I, I don't think you communicate too much at the moment i don't think the message of well you know we're all in it together let's just get on with it business as usual i don't think that's people are feeling very um isolated some people not everyone um but for i think it, it's really important um for managers at all levels um from the top to all the way down to keep communicating to keep saying it's okay we know it's hard and acknowledging that it's um, unprecedented, it's difficult, it's hard. And, and I think people, things are so uncertain that we want some certainty. We know that with mental health, one of the things that helps is us having a sense of control, of being mm. in control of our own little world. We've all got our own little bubbles. Some are bigger than others, okay? And if you look at what's coming out in the press, you know, the press keep pushing. When's lockdown going to end? When lockdown going to end? We want a date. We can't give a date. So if you're working and you know that things are, are changing, things are tough, what we want is someone to say, actually, this is what we plan to do. Now, that's hard. That is hard for business leaders to do. But if you can't do that, I think you need to be honest and say, we can't tell you this at the time, but this is what we can do for you. And I think people want that transparency. They want that clear message saying, what's going to happen? What's going to happen next week? We talk about living day to day and i think yes that's what we've got to do in the world of mental health we say one day at a time it's very important but there's so much big stuff going on at the moment and that's actually quite hard to, to to maintain that especially when you're working for an organization where things are so up in the air so leaders ceos you need i think i do believe you need to sort of say it's all right we're all feeling it but this is what we can do for you at the moment and i'm saying thank you yes absolutely can't, can't say yeah. thank you often enough i think as a manager yeah, yeah. and i think uh, and we've all worked for organizations where when someone gets up and publicly says thank you it means so much and yeah. for some people yeah i know some organizations are giving bonuses they're providing food parcels they're providing different bits and pieces that you can have which is wonderful but i think as human beings fundamentally what we often like to hear is Thank you. And it meant that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Mean it. Okay. Um, we often talk about, um, and I'm talking now not just about people going into work, um, but people working remotely as well, um, about spotting the signs that someone's not perhaps coping so well. Um, and it, it's a lot of training that we've done in the past um, on that. Um, and we say that um, managers in particular, if you are a manager, should be looking out for colleagues who are, who are um, unwell physically um, or mentally perhaps um, unwell. But it's hard at the moment um, and to keep up coping strategies. A lot of people with known, if they know that they've got mental health um, conditions, will have had coping strategies in place already. Um, and a lot of that, and I know from talking to you and working with you, um, Kerry, is things like exercise. But what are you doing now that you can't swim three times a week or whatever it was? <laughs> no. Oh, my word. I was, so I, I, I have a mental health condition. I'm fairly open about it. I've had it for many, many years. The last two years, I can honestly say that I've really kind of dug deep and I have had a lot of support from mental health services. And I have created a way which means I can cope. It doesn't take over my life. And I'm incredi incredibly lucky that I'm at that position. Um, but it does mean that there's certain things that I have to do to keep well. One of them is, is, is having physical exercise. So as Bella said, I swim three times a week. I, I go to the gym. I hate the gym, but I go and it keeps me well. Um, and when they said when we were reaching lockdown, I remember I went down the gym every day thinking, oh, my word, what am I going to do if they lock us down? They won't lock the gym down. Um, and they have. And also, I know a lot of our members have corporate memberships for, for their staff, for their colleagues. Um, so what am I doing? Well, OK, obviously, I've got to abide by, you know, the advice from the government. Am I going out once a day? 
Um, there's an awful lot of runners. I, I can't run anymore for health reasons, so I'm down to walking. Um, so what my local gym have done is they've put classes online. I'm still paying my gym membership because that's the thing, okay? A lot of people are still paying their gym membership. So all those that you're paying your corporate gym membership, you know, the people that control that budget, what are you getting getting for that? So I kind of think that we need to be uh, do what we can online. I think we've got to try and mirror what we did, what we gave staff, you know, before COVID-19. We've got to try and mirror that in whichever way we can. Um, so, you know, online, what's your gym doing? If you're paying a membership, can they provide stuff remotely for you? And that is what I'm having to do. And that is that is kind of saving me a bit at the moment. I'm, I can't swim. Um, and I'm quite upset by that. And I did think about Opal Water swimming, but then realised that it's far too far from my house because I live in London. So I'm not going to be able to get away with that. So I'm going to have to put up with online gym membership and um, classes. I do classes. It's great. And I feel like I'm still part of um, a community for me, mm. which works. And of course, for other people, it's going to be other things because we're not all into gym. You know, it, it mm. could be other social things, clubs, knitting uh choirs everything so can we do that in a different way is what i would say to people and i mean going back to you and your routines i mean routines are so weird now um <laughs> do you have any advice for people i mean there's quite a lot of pressure all right i mean i've worked from home for a very long time um for 12 years and now I'm seeing lots and lots of advice out there on, well, you should get up at the same time and then you should do <laughs> yoga and, and then you should eat your breakfast and, and, and then you should put your suit on or, you know, whatever and put your work perfume on. I've even seen this. this often, but the guys can do this as well, you know, the work aftershave. And, and I'm watching and I'm reading this thinking it, it's not work like this for me. I mean, I remember when I first started working from home and I did try to do all of this and I tried to do sort of, silly things like um i used to have a two-hour commute when i when i lived in london so i used to try and think well i ought to log on two hours earlier and log off two hours later because that's the extra time i've got back um and you know i take my phone with me everywhere i go in case somebody calls i mean yeah have you got any sort of advice on that <laughs> i do remember when so those that don't know, uh, Bella and I used to work together very closely a few years ago. And um, I remember when um, Bella said to me, you know, if you've got something to do, work from home, which was a whole really weird concept for me at the time. Didn't really think home working was for me. I like getting up. I like the social interaction. I find it keeps me well. Um, and I remember the one of the very first times I started working from home, I felt as I was under this enormous pressure to, to prove that I was working and not just sitting at home watching this morning or my personal favourite of bargain hunt, which I still work, but that's lunchtime. So that's OK. And um, I remember I, I, I had the fun. I took like you, Bella, I took it everywhere I went. And I remember the one time I didn't pick it up when I went for a, um, uh, a comfort break uh, or the loo is what I call it. And Bella rang and I couldn't get to the phone. And I remember when I got to the phone, I rang her back and went, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, I was on the toilet. And Bella saying to me, you can have a break, you know. So the thing about remote work, couple of things here, we mentioned routine. Everywhere you go at the moment, and I'm sorry, I'm gonna have a bit of a moan, it's, it's positive affirmations and routine. That's what's gonna get us all through. Well, for some of us, yes, for, for, for others, it's actually like, really? because I don't want to be positive at this moment in time and my routine the first week of lockdown yes I got up at seven and I went for a walk and you know and I I logged on and like Bella said I did yoga and I put a full face of makeup on and all that kind of stuff we're now in what week four that's gone out the window and I actually think yes for some of us routine is very very important if that's what works for you great but if it doesn't don't beat yourself up about it okay we are going through a major change and when we look at change there's five steps of promotion change and it's a journey i'm not going to bore you with it now um you can look it up it's quite interesting it's a bit like the seven stages of grief um but we all go on through that journey at different ways so some of us will be bang on routine for the first three weeks other of us will be like yeah i'm working from home i don't have to get up till half eight and then i'm literally going to log on you know and sit in bed and do my work the thing is and the key thing for me here is that you, the main aim is to function 
and to function at the right level so you can do your job, so you can enjoy what you can enjoy. But routine is great for some, it's not for others. Routines will change. It takes a while to slip into a new routine. For me, don't beat yourself up. You start beating yeah. yourself up, you're putting yourself under more pressure. You will feel like a failure. So don't beat yourself up. And um, I think mindfulness, we talk about tools. Mindfulness for me at the moment is so incredibly important because it's about being in that moment, being in the present and then moving on. And I think for a lot of us, that's what we need. Mm. So how about advice for, for managers um, of spotting the signs that somebody might not be well and this might be spotting signs somebody that you don't, you're no longer in the same physical space as? Yeah. So I think this is quite an interesting one because like obviously I can see you and everyone out there, I think it's about 100 people, thank you for joining us, you can see me, I can't see you. Um, I'm a very visual person so I like to see people. So I just thought, oh, well, we're going to video conference. It's great. I can still see whether so-and-so's looking okay. But actually, not everyone is visual. And that's the same whether we're working remotely or not. You'll get some people in the office that are very visual, some people that aren't. We would usually talk about the ABC when it comes to spotting signs. That's appearance, behaviour and communication. Now, we do not want to become sort of psychological detectives where every time someone does something slightly different, we then diagnose them with a mental health condition. And I, I could tell you many stories about where that's happened, you know. What this is about, spotting the signs, is where people, we are human. What makes us human is that we like routine. We do like routine, even if we don't realise that it's routine, but it is. And very often when we become unwell, certain things tend to change. So our appearance can change. Well, we can't see our appearance now, particularly if people don't want to turn their video on. Um, Behaviours change. So if we look at that in terms of remote working, you know, how are your staff working? Are they still working at the same pace as they did when they're in the office? Are they suddenly not working at all? Are they working exceptionally long hours? Because people often talk about mental health and performance going down. When I become unwell, my performance goes through the roof because I'm not sleeping and because I've got high energy. So I start sending emails at two in the morning and I'm saying, give me more work. And I, I do worry at this moment in time, there's a lot of people that are remote working that are very isolated. And so for them, their community is coming from work, which means they are putting increased hours in. That's all they're yeah. doing is. So changes in how we, we work, the way we, how, how productive we are, I think is what I should be saying. So how whether it's talking. more work or less work. So missing deadlines yeah. or kind of taking on Rational. lots of work. Yeah. Yeah. Give me more. Give me, I've got this to do. I'm at home on my own. Mm. So what am I going to do? Yeah. And I think as managers, that's quite hard to turn and say, yeah, but, you know, that's great, that's brilliant, but we want to make sure that, that your, your well-being is good, that you're well. So, no, yeah, go and do something else. And I think that's where, as, as organisations, we can then sort of see whether there's anything else we mm. can advise people to do. But there's, well. there's other signs, isn't there? I mean, this is often the same as, as, as before, but things like um, missing deadlines, joining meetings yeah. late... Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we talked about the permission to take breaks for key workers, but also here, not taking breaks. You've talked about that. Um, can we talk about cameras? You've mentioned, you've touched Ooh. on this already, video conferencing and cameras, because it's a bit, um, everyone's video conferencing now, whether it's Zoom or Teams or, you know, whatever it is that people are using. And some people never turn their camera on. And some people always turn it on and some people sometimes do and sometimes don't. Should we read anything into that? You might, you could do. There could be a whole load. Of, okay, let's talk about, for me, okay, with someone who worries about stuff like this, be clear on what you want me to do. Is it going to be a conference call or is it going to be a video conferencing? Be very clear on what you want me to do. And I think that's important for managers. If you have a team meeting in the office every Friday, then I think it's okay to say, Let's have a video conference. Let's all have a cup of tea or a cup of coffee or a glass of water or lemon tea, whatever you have. Let's bring some cake and let's try and replica what we would do on a, on a Friday team meeting. So I think if you've got the technology to do it, to do that, but then you will get some people that don't want to turn their camera on. 
Now, as someone who's always been a, a manager for many number of years, I, and this is a question for you, Bella, I worry, I worry how far I can push the, why haven't you put your camera on? Mm. So if well, I've, yeah. go on. sorry, go if on. I've sent a message out saying we're having a team meeting on video conference and then someone doesn't put their camera on, how far can I go? Why haven't you put your camera on? To well, some people yeah. saying you're harassing me. Well, some people never turn their cameras on and some people don't because they, um, they don't use the camera. They've got a visual impairment. They don't read faces. Um, they don't see themselves. The camera doesn't work for them because of their own condition, um, their own disability. So that's one of the reasons. But there's, um, you know, there's turning cameras on for accessibility. If somebody else in the, in the team is lip reading, for example, yeah. Um, yeah. then they kind of need the camera. But I think there is, a, if somebody has been turning the camera on, but then doesn't turn it on from time to time, I don't think I'd say anything in a, in a big video conferencing meeting with everybody in the, in, in the room. Um, and if somebody doesn't, but if it's on a one-to-one -one and, and the managers of course should be having those one-to-one -one catch ups um and asking for that one-to-one -one catch up and if the camera isn't on then i think i would sort of say you know are you all right can you turn the camera on is there is there a problem and push that but um this is going to be the same thing if you say to somebody are you all right kerry what are you going to say yeah i'm fine you can turn I'm the camera on job. yeah why do you, yeah why and 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 it could be like i think that's a good point actually bella if you, we've all been working remotely for a while now and I think um, if people have been on camera and it's, it seems to be going well and suddenly they want to turn them off, that could be a sign. That could be a com under the ABC, you know, the appearance, behaviour and communication that comes under behaviour and communication and appearance, actually. Um, it, it, I think there's a lot of reasons, a lot of practical reasons why they don't put their cameras on. Um, it could be because, you know, the state of their house. I must admit, I've really enjoyed watching all the press reporters and famous people because uh, you can see into their houses and the first thing I do is I completely ignore what they're saying I'm looking in the background to see what they've got yeah so the tip there is teach people how to blur background yes so or make sure you know how to use, use the tools because actually it could be for someone with my brain it's a distraction when I, I'm looking to see what's in the background so it, it I'm not really listening i'm just looking to see what books you've got or what records you've got or you yeah, know I'm, I'm looking at the picture of, of, of what looks like a deer behind you yes uh, i have yeah. um, <laughs> but, exactly. so blur background is, is one blur of background the, but, yeah and i think as you said let's not forget about that for for some people seeing faces is really important around accessibility issues so i think if you need to use video conferencing because it's an adjustment and it works for you so you can communicate then i think that that needs to be voiced to other people that you're having meetings with so I think that's really important. And I think you can see, I mean, the camera not being turned on, there's quite a lot in the press at the moment about domestic abuse um, mm. with people being in lockdown. I mean, it might be that I don't want you to see me because I've been beaten up. Um, yeah, that's visible. Be. So or because that's, I, I, I just can't bother to get dressed because I'm feeling really low. Yeah. So it could um, be it could be something practical like the dog's about to run in or the kids are running in you know and it's just you're trying to do your job the best way you possibly can and yet there's all these distractions and i think that's another thing about remote working is that i think we might need to be a little bit more compassionate about how we allow people to do their work so you know especially with with homeschooling at the moment and the kids being off dogs not being able to walk more than once a day you know, it might be that we do need managers to just understand that there might be times where I need to just duck out for half an hour, but I will log on later and, and, and finish the work. And so that kind of goes against, not against, but kind of rubs against the whole spotting the signs of people working irregular hours. So it, it then goes back to making sure individuals and managers can have a conversation about how the remote working is working for them mm. and their well-being and their life. Mm. so that you can adjust it yeah no I want to go back because this is really it's easier said than done to say you know if we're having this conversation I have a meeting with you as your manager and I say oh Kerry you've not been turning your camera on you say yeah I don't feel like it 
it's actually quite hard to push that as a manager it's quite hard to say well actually I'd quite like to see your face why yeah I think as a as a manager I think I would say oh can I ask why that is because you know we've been talking on video conferencing for the last couple of weeks but what's changed so I think I would 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 push it that far and then I think I would also as a manager explain why I think it's important to maintain video conferencing but so would you why? say I think I'd say I might be concerned I'm concerned that you're not putting it on I'm worrying if you, I mean I'm wondering if you're okay because you say you're fine but the camera's not on I can't see if you're fine I'm worried. yeah I think I think that's easy to do if someone has always put their camera on and it's suddenly gone off because what you can do is say I'm concerned as a manager I'm concerned you know um because we've always spoken on video conference and now you've turned it off so for me you've got to understand I'm going to say to you I am concerned is there something you need to talk to me about is there anything we can do for you I think that's a good way because we always talk about when you are spotting the signs and someone's behavior appearance communication has changed as managers I always say use facts use facts based evidence you did this mm. we've done that I've noticed so always take responsibility okay as manager take responsibility but if someone refuses to put their video on from day one that's where it gets tricky and i'm not sure how far you can push it mm. if I'm honest. i think then it's the other things that you need to, to look at the other spotting the signs the sound of their voice um you know that's that's the communication and the other things that you're talking about like whether they're you know, joining meetings late, sending emails late, missing deadlines, being productive or not. I think that you might need to pay closer attention to other things. Yeah. Um, and keep in mind that they're, they're not turning the camera on as well. And there may, may be something else going on on there. Um, and I think having that conversation, because we always used to say, try and have that conversation in person, have no distractions find a quiet time that you can sit or maybe go for a walk with each other so that you can talk and walk at the same time. None of this is possible at the moment. So it is harder for managers to have that conversation, but it doesn't mean that you shouldn't have it. It's I, I, uh, I totally agree. I think the way in which I think even now more than ever, we need to maintain levels of communication. Some people will love videoing. Some people will love talking on the phone. Some people will love group chat. Some people will like texting. Um, there's all different ways. Some people prefer emailing. But I think as a manager, and I'm not going to lie, I think it's tough for everyone, but I think if you've got a team and your team are working remotely and it's something you don't usually do, as managers, we've not only been going to try and maintain the business, but we've also got to try and maintain that sense of team spirit, working mm -hmm. together as a team. And that's easier said than done when you've got a team what could be very diverse in their skills and their abilities and people like to converse in different ways so i think again this has got to come from the top it's you know manager managers managers whoever how far you go up has got to say all right okay do you know what we might just need to just have a break and let people just come together and just have a chat online or whatever it is we do just so that people feel as though they've got some space because my concern is that people are going to just be working flat out for lots of reasons. Yeah. One, because they're not well. Two, because they're worried about their jobs and their finances and their money and all that kind of stuff. So having someone to say stop is good. I think it's really interesting because you and I are quite different because you're much more of an extrovert than I am. Um, yeah. I think it's fair to say. And working from home has always been great for me. Um, but one of the things that I've found hard is actually a little bit too much communication, which I'm not used to. <laughs> Um, so there's lots of these WhatsApp groups and uh, with colleagues and then without colleagues and virtual whatever in the evening and you know drinks and book group and things in the evenings with my friends and I'm feeling a bit overwhelmed actually and I think perhaps the permission as well that you don't have to join the colleagues WhatsApp groups that are sending you know cute videos uh, you can tell it's not me the cute video yeah. um, <laughs> mirror what you do in the workplace you know, we all know in workplaces there's always a group of people that might go and do something a bit more social than others but it's not that doesn't necessarily mean that everyone has to go it's not always a free line whip for everyone so that should be the same when we're working remotely and we're doing sort of virtual groups 
I think if someone who would usually be the life and soul of the party suddenly isn't getting involved, and again, that could be an indicator they're not feeling very, very well. They could be fine. It could be they've just had enough of talking constantly on the phone to people at work and they in the evening they just want to sit and read a book. But I think it goes back to having that conversation and just saying to people, yeah. are you all right? I think separating out, if you have got these sort of Slack or WhatsApp or whatever groups that you've got, the ones that are social that you could opt out of and the ones that are important and work, because what I don't want to do is miss out on that important work bit that was in the middle of a, a lot of, you know, videos of giraffes or whatever it is that are being circulated um i haven't seen those bella well, <laughs> you must I'm, send them to me <laughs> I'm, just, I'm making that up but so you know <laughs> retaining maintaining so that i can concentrate on the ones that are work and i can ignore the ones that are not work if i don't feel like joining in i think that's quite important but i wanted to move on just in the last few bits about you know you, you've said a few times about maintaining for managers and employers maintaining what you were doing as well-being strategies before this happened and there are some things that you can do because you can think oh well you know um we used to talk to members didn't we we used to talk to businesses that had um sort of chow and chat canteen lunches where people used to get together and talk um, and bicycle smoothies and step yeah, challenges I remember that. where people used to go out for a walk together and count their steps and it was all part of well-being strategies to keep people well are all of these out of the window now no, I don't think so. I think along with, you know, look, the situation we're in, the society and the work that we, we work in has changed. It has changed a lot. But the fact that we're human hasn't. So all those anxieties, concerns, happiness, all that stuff is still there. So what I always talk about is giving people a choice, flexibility. So if you want a routine, you have that routine. If you're one of those people that loves a routine, talk with your manager or your manager can say to the team, who wants a set routine? We'll do it. Some schools are doing that, some aren't. That's but if, interesting, if, yeah, because I mean, we've had a question in actually on, on that because they're saying that some people, um, and this maybe relates back to what I was saying, um, really struggling with having less structure in their day because we've talked about, you know, and it's this really difficult balance, the compassion allowing people who may be homeschooling their kids to work yeah. different hours or, you know, not having the routines. But for some people, they really need that structure. Don't yeah. They? yeah. Yeah. And, and, I, and I and I I thought I, I, I do like a routine, but I have a very I have a flexible routine. I don't build myself up about it anymore. You know, and, and it's took me a long time to it took me a long time to get there you know other people i know are really really struggling with lack of routine so if you need a routine talk to someone sit down map out the things that you need to do every day work breaks the lot set alarms to have your breaks bella and i have spoken about how sometimes we will work in different rooms different mm -hmm. scenery get up have, you know set activity alarms so that you get up and move that kind of stuff if yeah, the routine but, works for you but it's for the managers to give that permission as well. And I think this is Absolutely. where it comes back to being individual because one individual that you manage might need to change their routines and work different hours or be more flexible. But somebody else who's struggling, um, and this is again to spotting the signs and, and giving that time in the conversation to talk about it. Say, look, actually, I miss the structure of the day. This is Bridget from um, Bridget is uh, asked this question about how managing somebody, a team member, um, who's indicating that they're really struggling with having less structure. So mm. I think there for any tips there is to work with that individual to sort out the routine that they need and it could be you know for a variety of reasons that they do so at this time you will do this we'll put in i mean i've done things like putting calendars at um reminders at 11 30s activity break mm -hmm. and you will stop and you will do some activity at this point and you can put in reminders as well to say okay lunch will be between one and two um yeah lock that time out in your time in your diary so you don't get meetings i'm getting meetings bleeding into all sorts of strange yeah. times, um out that, of hours that is one thing i've noticed lunchtime meetings seem to be the norm people yeah. don't have lunchtime anymore and i think that's really hard as an individual to say well, what am i supposed to have lunch so that does need to come from the top to say you are entitled to breaks you're entitled to breathe you're entitled to have a lunch break 
if mm. business dictates that we have to work long hours, I, I, and I'm, you know, I know that happens and that's fine. But even after working over a, a long period of stretch, long hours, we still need to be given that permission to say it's okay to stop and breathe, and that's what it's all about. So whereas some people love routine others don't and I know that if you're a manager and you're listening you'll be thinking well how the, how the hell am I going to manage this I've got half the team that want routine half that don't but think about what it's like in the workplace mm. no one in an office works exactly the same way so we've kind of got to be mindful about that I think and just allow that compassion and flexibility where business allows us to do it so it goes back to talking to staff allowing staff to talk asking each other how we are um I wonder how many of us that work in offices are still encouraged to have that kind of what I call, you know, tea room chat. Do you know what I mean, Bella, where you kind of get yeah. up from your desk and yeah. make a cup of tea? I wonder how much of that is still happening in business, because I'm pretty sure it, it probably isn't as much. So we need to encourage that if we want it. That's the thing. Well, that goes back to what we were saying before, because I think there's there's things that we can do individually as a manager. And I'm not saying this is easy, which is check in with every team member and work out what routine works for them right now and see if you can accommodate that with working as a team and the needs of the business that some people will need structure and maybe give them some advice and tips on how to put that structure in place by managing their calendar um, in, in many ways and others will need the flexibility but also you know that comes back to what we were saying about all these well-being strategies there are things and you know everyone's got very creative now about concerts online and museum tours online so yeah. i think employers can do the same you've already sort of talked about if you've got a corporate gym membership see what you can get for um paying that corporate fee that's online now so that you can get those classes um online but you've you've talked about sort of putting in a tea and cake or whatever it is that you, you were saying on friday um on there i mean that that's a possibility uh as well um and you can have lunch with colleagues still um and and um i think that's still a a possibility and one of the other things that we talked about is um things like yoga and pilates classes those can be do done online and you can also ask people um you know they might have skills colleagues might have skills that they can share and that they're willing to share so you might have somebody who is a yoga teacher um, who's willing to set up and use zoom or something or teams to to, to teach um, little yoga classes or knitting having the book groups um, book groups film club all sorts of things like that I mean I think again sometimes employees colleagues need permission um, and need somebody to take the lead in doing that. It, it's quite hard sometimes to take the initiative and do it yourself. So I think there is that sort of um, needing, needing permission to be able to set those up and they can still happen. Um, and I think um, we may have uh, lost Kerry temporarily. So I'm gonna carry on and take some of the, the, the questions here as well, but um, just filling, filling in on that. Um, there's other things as well that employers should remember and that's things like the um, employee assistance programs um, that they often have in place where there's counseling and there's somebody available to talk to and reminding colleagues that they still exist that they can still contact them by phone by skype by um, by video chat um, and circulating that regularly putting that somewhere that can be can be seen um, and other things as well that um, can be done as well. I mean, um, some managers, some employees are sort of getting uh, people to gather together the lists of things that can be done virtually that are out there that I mentioned already. Things like virtual museum and art gallery tours, concerts, theatres, uh, classes, fitness classes, yoga classes, Pilates classes, and getting other people to contribute anything that they found that's, that's really good as well. And then circulating that to, to people, because some people might be living alone. And for some people, the challenges of being in lockdown or being with your family all the time and having too many people around. And um, other people, um, I think are struggling perhaps because they're living alone and it's lonely and i think there's a there's a question here as well um and it's um from from jenny um 
And she's saying, you know, I'm generally seen as a smiling, high energy, humorous individual. Um, but during COVID, none of my wider team, not even friends, have contacted me to see how I'm doing. And yeah, that's, that's a really important and interesting point. I'm usually the one who reaches out first to check that they are okay. So yeah, Jenny, I mean, if you're, you're struggling, I think you're quite right. There are people who are struggling and, um, you know, mentioning that check in on people and that's for managers particularly, but it's also for colleagues, check in on people. And it's not always the people who you think of, you think, oh, you know, this person's always smiling and happy. They'll be coping fine. That might not be the case. And I think it is important just to keep checking in, checking in more often, more regularly. Um, so um, I think uh, I'm getting a message here to say that uh, the joys of internet and broadband connection at the moment has, mean, has meant that Kerry's screen is frozen and she's unable to rejoin us. So I'm gonna carry on um, for the next few minutes just answering some of the questions. So I think uh, that one from Jenny is a really, really important point there um, that, 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 that has been made. Um, it's, yeah, there's another one um, here from Mansour who's saying um, it's a positive thing to have leadership and communications on well-being, all the things I've just talked about, but there is a danger of it being overwhelming when it comes over many channels um, and levels in a big organisation. So I think that too, um, you know, Mansour is a really important point. And I talked about being slightly overwhelmed by things coming in on different channels uh, for, for me at the moment and I think that's as an employer um, maybe give it as a task if there is somebody in your communications team to say if you've got any tips on well-being or any of these um, virtual uh, tours museums classes and things send them to one place in communications to one person it's their job to collate them and circulate a list of that um, out say maybe once a week or twice a week or put them in one one place so um, the approaches are coordinated and I think that's particularly important um, as Mansour says for a large organization because sometimes otherwise you'll get things the same thing from 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 lots lots of different people um, so I think that's that's a really um, really important point um, yeah, there's, there's one from Magdalena, um, which is giving support to team members when they are in a different country to the one that you are as a manager. Um, so yeah, Magdalena, you, you say that you're in Poland, um, but you've got people working with you who are far away from their dearest ones in India, the UK, Ukraine, and they can't meet. Um, that, that is so difficult at the moment. And I think... Um, there is no substitute for your own family, your, the people that you really, really want to be with. But um, I think these are the people who particularly need to be uh, contacted more frequently um, and reached out to and, and um, stay in contact more often and may need some of the, the social contact as well as the work contact that, that were, um, I was talking about earlier to, to give them and, and check in to see that they are okay. Now, they can, can be time um, time zone problems with that if you're very far apart um, time zone wise so I think again back to communication to talk to people about when is a good time for you because it might be really early for them but really late for you um, and that's something that, that, that does need to be managed the other thing um, that can be quite helpful as well is that um, some people depending on their job as well um, might not or what they what they did in the office might not have the technical skills so it's all very well saying there's lots of these video tutorials um, and online services but if you don't know how to install that app onto your computer you don't know how to get on to whatsapp or, or or whatever that is that can be um really difficult and it could be that you can if you've got the support of a, a tech team an ict team um, then you can ask your um, ICT team to help people with, with tutorials one-to-one -one or um, perhaps for, um, you know, in a conference call on how to do this um, and you know, simply how to install 
WhatsApp onto your phone if you haven't already got it. And I know a lot of people might be thinking, is that true? But there's people who don't know how to do that um, or how to go online to get onto one of these virtual tours or a class. And Kerry, I think you're back. Yeah, so I'm just, just, just going to add on the chat. I'm so sorry. Everything just went completely... <laughs> So, so much for mental health and anxiety and all sorts. That was a bit stressful. I'm really sorry, everyone, but I am back now. So, um, yeah, sorry, Bella, I'll let you continue. Yeah, I was just answering some of the questions there. So, um, I was just sort of talking about some people needing to be contacted more often because they're sort of seen to be the person who's always doing the contacting themselves they're the ones who are reaching out to other people but yeah. they also need the support and, and i think it's really important to check in on people um and um also uh, thinking i've got another question here from um Iconia, uh, thinking um about when the lockdown is lifted um yeah now this is an interesting one so lots of us will be keen to get out of the house and and rush back into work but i think there will be some people will perhaps feel struggle with that will not feel comfortable about going back and there, there may well be anxiety I and mean, we don't know what you think about that um kerry about oh i i i know i'm going to struggle um because i one of my issues is that i have to go out otherwise i just i i, I become quite agoraphobic and I've noticed only going out once a day. I noticed last week the anxiety creeping in when I had to leave the house. So I think I'm personally going to find that quite difficult. So I'm already thinking about my strategies to try and make sure that I can um, go out panic free. It's easy for me because I have those. Those of you that haven't, I think it's going to be really important for you to reach out and get some support in whichever form it might be. It might be that when we first start going out, we need to go out with someone else. Go to places that you know, places that you're comfortable with, places that you've been to before. Don't put too much pressure on yourself. And in regards to getting back to work, I think one of the things that people um, are going to struggle with is commuting. If you commute on packed trains and buses and tubes, I think we're going to find it quite difficult. So I think employers, we need to be mindful of that. We might have to do staggered returns. We might need to yeah. be flexible yeah. with letting people come back into work early or late. Um, I think, and I think, yeah. Go on, sorry, Bella. Yeah, staggered times, but maybe even a phased return to work, um, a bit like after a long sickness absence. So, yes, um, a couple of days in, a couple of days still at home, because it can be quite overwhelming to come back. So, I think treating it perhaps after a lot as long as sickness absence. I know it's not a sickness absence, but those staggered hours, coming in late, coming home, and maybe you know, short days coming in that might be something that some people will need other people it's not everyone other people will be longing to get back to the old routines but i think that's that's a, an interesting one an important one i just wanted to we've got quite a lot of questions so i'm trying to get through um yeah there's one on surveys on insights on mental health and well-being there's a lot of employers surveying their staff again be coordinated on this uh, if you get too many surveys people won't answer and the people that you do answer are the ones who like answering surveys. It's more interesting sometimes to know who doesn't, not who doesn't if they're anonymous, but how, what the take up is, because that might tell you something about how people are coping if they're not res responding to surveys. But I think sometimes now, rather than a survey, and I know this is difficult for big organizations, managers, people managers talking to their teams more often and checking in is, is perhaps more of a, an indicator um yeah and yeah there's a really important one from catherine um just just before we're due to finish which is remembering that um some people um have other challenges at the moment like not being able to go to medical appointments cancelled appointments homeschooling illness and family members so there's a lot of other stuff that's going on that people might need encouragement to talk to their managers about and see if employers can help um in in there so acknowledging that nobody knows really what what to do but having that space to talk about it so yeah we're coming to the close of of today so i don't want to, to to go over and i'm sorry if your questions haven't haven't been answered and we haven't uh, had time but the webinar will be available to you on our website by the end of the day tomorrow uh, on the covid19 toolkit and there's some spotting the sign tip, signs tips there as well um, for supporting and reassuring uh, employees so 
do do have a look at that and if you do have any other questions um, mem members and partners of, of business disability forum you can always contact us um, via the advice service at advice at business disability forum dot org dot uk um, or just contact us uh, at inquiries at business disability forum dot org dot uk um, but thank you so much for taking the time this morning um, well morning for us here in the uk to, to listen to us um, and so and for engaging with us uh, for this hour and thank you kerry yeah can i just say thank you everybody for listening i hope you find it useful my one top tip is apple a day if you want to know what apple a day is google it it's about mindfulness being in the present uh, acknowledge pause pull back let go and explore that's my top tip for day by day live day, day by day be compassionate be kind don't beat yourself up it's really important and the other thing is is that can i just give a sh quick very quick shout out a quick plug we're doing a couple of um, interactive training sessions and not quite like a webinar next week for a business disability forum on the 28th of April, which is a Tuesday. We're doing a session in the morning and one in the afternoon. The morning is for managers and it's about working from home, developing emotional resilience and mental well-being. So there'll be lots of tips on there about what managers can do. And then there's one in the afternoon for individuals. So if you can and you're interested, do get in touch there all the information will be on the bdf website so hopefully i'll get to speak to some of you again really soon but thank you so much thank you kerry and thank you to all there as well and thank you to everyone for listening bye bye <laughs>